welcome back to Talking Europe. We are now in Funchal, the capital of Madeira and home to around a third of its population. Now this is the place where the two big industries here really collide. Around a million tourists visit the archipelago each year, most of them passing through Funchal and a great many of them taste testing the famous Madeira wine while they're here. So that's where we're going to get started. Let's go. We've brought you now to this 17th century building, a former monastery, but this might give you a little clue as to what goes on here now. Uh, this is Blandy's Wine Lodge. Uh, Blandy's one of the biggest Madeira producers, and uh, there are currently almost 700,000 litres of wine ageing within these historic walls. Uh, we've come here to meet the chief winologist or winemaker, Francisco nice Albuquerque. Nice to meet you. Hi yeah. there. Fine. Um, first question, your brother is actually president of Madeira, is that correct? Yes. <laughs> you were never tempted by politics yourself? No. OK, well, we'll keep things wine related then. Tell us more about why the fact that this is a volcanic island is actually makes a difference to the wine. Well, uh, first of all, we suffer always the influence of the sea, the winds from the sea, the salinity from the sea, and it's, it's not easy to translate this kind of soil for a, a midland or a big country. Now you have big output here at Blandy's, yes. but actually quite small producers. We, we buy every harvest for uh, 478 producers. Some of them, they produce only 115 kilos, two boxes or three boxes of grapes, but all of them are important. The wine is very clearly identified among uh, wine lovers. It has that protected origin status of yes. DOP, that European yes. label. But I have seen, for example, yeah. Californian producers making Madeira. Yeah. Is there a threat to Madeira wine? You can protect it because they have a proper legislation and uh, extra shagan you don't have control and they produce also in the Azerbaijan and uh, Russia. It's not the same wine. You don't recognize if you know the model because um, have a, a terroir, a very specific terroir. It's not easy to make something like Madeira if you don't have the conditions of the island. So you were looking for more help from the European Union, subsidies, that kind of thing? Yes, of course, because uh, it's impossible uh, to continue producing and to fix it to people at the land if you don't have subsidised the people to stay and to preserve it because the quality of the produce here in the island are very high. And you don't have tourism in Madari if you don't have agriculture. Well, I suppose we will have to wait and see. For now, though, thank you very much, Francisco Albuquerque, well, for speaking to us. Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you. you very much. Well, uh, we're going to move on and talk about more political matters now. Uh, we're joined by newly elected MEP Sara Saudash. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Now, you're with the Socialist Party. So yes. So that's the party of government in Portugal. Yes. Uh, but an opposition party here in Madeira. Yes, yes. The main opposition party here in Madeira. Well, I'd like to talk to you about wine. We've talked a lot about wine in our programme. Portugal, the fifth biggest wine producer in the EU. And Madeira, to me, just seems to almost be in the blood of people on this island. Yes. Is that how you see it? Yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, when we go to dinner and even in our table at our homes, we always drink a, a glass of wine uh, with the meal. And especially Madeira wine, which is a different type of wine. And we're very proud about this product that uh, what made us known before uh, Cristiano Ronaldo arrived, so before people <laughs> knew about Madeira because of the wine. Now we're a bit more known because of uh, football also. <laughs> the economy here in Madeira, as in Portugal, has had really big highs and lows in recent years. Uh, since uh, Madeira gained its autonomous status after the Portuguese dictatorship. It's actually been the Madeira free zone that gives certain tax exemptions to companies here. Questions have been asked about whether that could be slipping towards tax haven kind of status. Do you feel that's a danger? Um, I, I see our, our economic zone as a zone for economic prosperity that brings us growth for our island and also provides us with more jobs. As you know, we're an outermost region, so we have these constraints based on our geography about us being far away from the mainland. So these opportunities are important to boost our economy and to create more jobs and more richness for this region in particular. 
Just specifically on agriculture, most of the farms and plantations here are actually very small and don't earn a lot, up to 8,000 euros a year. Do they need special help from the EU? Yes, uh, I mean, we're an outermost region, so our orography is quite uh, specific. We have declives in our terrains of 16 to 25% of slopes and 7% uh, of our land is agriculture fields and 94% I think of our agricultures are small scale agriculture so they they have less than one hectare of land so we have um, uh, a small number of crops we, we rely on so European Union is is important first to for us the people to have access to different types of products and also to help export these products to uh, other other regions and other places yes all right well I'd like to stick with that agriculture theme and uh, just to show you and our viewers a report now we'll pick up again afterwards it's about young farmers who of course are the future of farming and in an increasingly connected world young farmers are ever more exchanging their expertise. Our reporter Luke Brown has been with some French farmers to Estonia to see what they've been learning in the Baltics. Getting stuck into life on an Estonian farm. Tiffen and Alain are from Brittany. They're students at a high school specialising in agriculture here on an Erasmus exchange. Alain is showing off what he's learned. I knew that there had been a few births, but I didn't think I would see one all the way through. Even though it's all sticky, it's cute. It's the miracle of life. In France or in Estonia, carving is a physical job. But the experience is all about learning new ways of working. They have some techniques here that we don't have in France. We don't do it the same way. We don't force it so much in France. Thank you. The two 16-year-olds are spending two weeks in Estonia, lending a hand with the daily running of the farm and doing their best to overcome the language barrier. Sometimes their English is good, sometimes less so, but we can understand. Well, I can. Alan doesn't really speak. So I understand. Sometimes some of them only speak a bit of English. Then it's more difficult. <laughs> this trip is the first time that the pair have travelled by aeroplane. There are 600 head of cattle here, typical for Estonia, where the average size is much bigger and more intensive than in France. Learning how things are done far from home is at the heart of the Erasmus program. The farms here are bigger. They have more equipment, more farm workers. They are very different to farms in France. Two more students, Alexei and Kilian, are also hard at work. Each pupil received 780 euros from the Erasmus Fund. That pays for travel, lodging and food. Here the boys get more first-hand experience of local farm equipment. More than one in five of the 85,000 French Erasmus students last year come from vocational training courses like this. They all use the common agricultural policy, so it's important that they realize that in Estonia or in another country. They do things that work with the same goal in mind. In all, 10 million youngsters have participated over the past three decades in the Erasmus program. The current EU-wide budget for Erasmus is 2.2 billion euros a year, but that's set to increase sharply due to its success. We want to triple the budget. We're already sure that it will double, and that would mean 30 billion euros for the period 2021 to 2027 to finance more people to travel. The atmosphere is decidedly studious for these Erasmus students. Camelia and Bianca are from Romania. Since arriving in France in September, the experience has already broadened their horizons. It's also important that I learn about myself. I know I don't have any limits. I can do whatever I want. Erasmus isn't just about their personal ambitions, but also about contributing to farming back home in Romania. This experience will help Romanian farming a great deal, because I will return home. I have my dreams. I want to do great things for farming. Erasmus has been helping the cross-pollination of ideas across Europe since 1989. Candidates for this year's programme have until February to apply.
Well, we've just popped outside now into one of St Charles' many parks and gardens, and you can see they don't call it the Island of Flowers for nothing. We're still in the company of Sara Sardash. Thanks for staying with us. Let's take a little walk through this garden. Um, I'm interested, off the back of that report we just saw there about young people, um, here in Madeira, uh, quite a lot of young people are actually out of work. Uh, what are the difficulties for young people here? We have a university here in Madeira, uh, but uh, not all courses are provided here. So most of our youth that wants to proceed with university studies, we need to go abroad to the mainland Portugal. Some of them don't come back because uh, there's not that many opportunities for recently university graduates here in Madeira in some specific uh, sectors or fields. And we also have an important unemployment rate and one third of uh, long duration unemployed people are actually youth and they are highly educated and qualified. So it will be important to bring them back to the, uh, to, to the job market. What are your ideas about getting people from Madeira even if they do go away, to come back and start jobs, start families on this island? Um, here, for instance, this island is very safe and provides security to the family and it's a, a, a quite nice place to live and to prosper, but uh, our education system needs to improve, our healthcare system needs to improve. Well, just one last question then. People we've spoken to tell us that Madeira has changed quite a lot since Portugal joined the EU in 1986. What's your prediction or perhaps your hope for Madeira in another 30 years' time? And that's a, an important question. When I was born and when I was a kid, it took us one whole day to go around the island. And now we can do that in one, two hours easily. So we advanced a lot in our infrastructures, also in um, our social system. But there's a lot more to be done. My hope for Madeira will be for us in the next 30 years to be in the forefront of sustainable tourism. Uh, one fourth of our GDP relies on tourism and it will be important to change this industry into becoming more sustainable. I mean, climate change is in the, in the, in the agenda today. It's an emergency. We need to tackle it and how we can transform this sector into having a more sustainable tourism. All right. Well, thanks so much for speaking to us, Sara Sardash. Thanks for having me. We're just continuing the theme of looking to the future. A new version of the EU's common agricultural policy is currently being thrashed out a little bit over time, it ought to be said. Worries about the post-Brexit European budget and other battles continuing on in Brussels. Our correspondent Alex Le Bourdon has entered the melee for us. The nominee to be the EU's new agriculture commissioner is having to retake his oral exam. His answers the first time around left MEPs unconvinced. I wish to explain in more detail. And his role is a particularly important one at this juncture. The EU is struggling to reform its common agricultural policy, the CAP. A text for the reform was prepared under the previous commission, but the European Parliament has yet to debate and vote on it. Herbert Dorfman, a Conservative MEP, asks the obvious question. How do you intend to proceed in the weeks and months ahead? Do you want us in Parliament to continue with the work that's already been done? My mandate, as given to me by the Commission President, Mrs. von der Leyen, is to negotiate and conclude that reform, and to negotiate it in the context of further parliamentary work. In other words, the text won't be scrapped, but it can be changed. It's what many MEPs wanted to hear especially the new ones, who will now get a chance to have their say. In some quarters, especially among the Greens, there's a desire to start over, almost from scratch. Then there are those who appear to want to pass the text as it is. So it seems to me the most reasonable position is to rework the existing text with an awareness clearly that it needs a bit of changing. Marianne Strail is also new in her job at a critical moment. She heads the Farming Federation in the Belgian region of Wallonia. One of her main roles is to transmit local farmers' concerns to the EU institutions as they seek to reform the CAP, one of the bloc's oldest joint initiatives. The CAP had several objectives. One was to boost production. Europe was emerging from the war. It was important to bring consumer prices down. Another aim was to make sure farmers could make a living. And here it's clear that earnings, at least in what I would call old Europe, are not at all at the level the CAP was supposed to put them at. She says she sees this every day as she visits members of the Federation. 
Laurent Gaumont runs a family farm and says he struggles to make ends meet. And things don't look like improving. Britain leaving means the CAP's budget is set to be cut. And of that smaller budget, a larger proportion is to be spent on environmental measures. 40% of the CAP budget has to go towards fighting climate change and protecting the environment. But economic and social needs should not be forgotten. Regulations concerning the environment and animal well-being entail big costs for us. And we can't transfer those costs to the price of our produce, so we really need European assistance to cope with this. Marianne Strail's Wallonian Federation is part of a bigger pan-European federation of farmers' unions, with offices right next to the European Parliament in Brussels. The Copa Cogeca represents everyone from small family farms to big agribusiness. It's engaged in an intensive networking and lobbying effort, fighting plans to give member states a bigger role in applying the CAP. We would end up having significantly differences in the implementation of the policy from one country to another. This is something that we cannot accept and we have battled and we are still battling strongly for this. The battle may rage on for many months yet. The European Commission recently presented contingency plans for the CAP to keep working into 2021 if the negotiations miss the deadline. As the sun sets here over Funchal, that is it for our programme as well. Thank you so much for watching. We hope to see you again very soon for another edition of Talking Europe.